All right, it's Father's Day weekend, and you all know that there are really two things that I enjoy talking about. One is men's health, everything to do with all the things that men have that most women don't have, including testosterone. And women do have testosterone, of course, but men have 12 times, 20 times more, typically. Prostate, erectile function, things like that. And the other element is what I called fathering, right? The action of being a father. What does that look like? And these are two areas where I put a lot of thought into, I do research uh, into, and then I practice it and fail <laughs> oftentimes, honestly. And I think as a father, it's not a matter of not failing, it's a matter of realizing that maybe there's a different way of doing things, of communicating with your kids, of, you know, of treating them, of interacting with them. And so for the last two years, and this is the third, I've had a Father's Day episode. One is episode 66. The other one, I believe, is episode 37 on how to rage teenage girls. And episode 66 is on, this is what I've learned this past year at that time. At the time, our older girls were still teenagers. They, one of them still is, but they're adults, 19 and 20. And I'm tr still trying to figure things out with my son, who just turned 12 years old, right? So things change biochemically with kids as they grow, just like they change with us. And sometimes the biochemical changes happen simultaneously, simultaneously. So, and no one really, there's no playbook or manual on this. So let me say this as it relates to the last year as a father. First of all, I'm super proud of our daughters. They're 20 and 19 years old. And all you can do and hope for is that your children become good adults that you're proud of. They're not perfect. They're not meant to be perfect. They don't have to be perfect. But overall, are they good human beings, right? Are they self-sufficient? Maybe sometimes. Are they comfortable in their skin? Sometimes, most of the times, not always. You know, girls have it tough, but we are super comfortable and proud of who they are as humans, as adult humans, very young adults, still trying to figure out the world. And I think they have a good foundation as to how to do that. So we're very proud of them. Our son, in terms of the fathering element, he just turned 12. And so he's going through hormonal changes that you can see. It's obvious. He's growing a little mustache, a little hair under the arms and attitude changes. He's trying to figure out what is going on in my body. Not quite there yet. So what happens biologically is that there's a spurt in production of testosterone, primarily from the adrenal glands, not yet from the testicles, at least for him, as, as best as I can tell. But there is a, a good amount of, so there are two areas that uh, men produce testosterone. Mostly is from the testicle, about 90, 95% is from the testicle. And a small amount is from the adrenal glands, which these are glands that sit right on top of the kidneys. And they produce about, you know, 5 to 10% of testosterone in, in humans. So most of his testosterone are kids that are 12 years old, give or take. It's coming from the adrenal glands, not, test, not the testes yet. That is soon to come. And that's when you see the crackling in the voice, more facial hair, more attitude. They kind of bulk up a little bit when you see all these changes occurring. What have I learned as a father of a 12-year-old son? Here's the takeaway. Primarily in the athletic world, so my son plays baseball, and, you know, what's our role as fathers when we're watching our kids play a sport? What's your approach? Are you a screamer? Come on, you know, perfect swing. Keep your elbow up. What are you doing? What are you swinging? You know, or are you the quiet type? that kind of just sit there and observe the game, or you're somewhere in between. And from what I've learned through experience and read, we have a, a, a significant impact on how our kids feel when they're playing their sport. We affect their play. Most kids, particularly sons, want to impress somebody on the field. Oftentimes, that somebody is the parent. And if it's the father that oftentimes goes to the game, they want to impress the father. They want to do things for their father as opposed to own it themselves, which is ultimately what we're trying to accomplish with them. We want them to own their successes and failures and figure it out. So you would see that my son swings and misses and then he looks for me. You know, where's my dad? And so forth. 
That's happening less and less now. I think in the last episode 66, about a year ago, it happened way more. And I spoke about it. The type of dad that I am, and I'm not saying uh, this <laughs> and praising myself or tweaking my own horn at all, because I'm still learning. But in that regard, the type of dad I am is one who I care about the process. I care about him controlling his emotions well and not acting up on the field if he strikes out or acting negatively towards a teammate. I care about that. I don't care if he strikes out every single time or if he misses a ball or, or things like that. That said, there's probably some body language, even though I'm not a big screamer or talker, that I'm doing that I'm not aware of that affects him. Maybe I'm nodding my head, you know, side to side, like a no in, in a slightly way that he can tell. Maybe my facial expression. So clearly I'm having an effect on him that's not always positive. So my son, now that he's 12 and he's more vocal, he said to me, Dad, you know, I'm all right if you don't go to the game this weekend. And he was being very respectful. And I really took that as, oh, wow, there's something here. I, I am having some sort of uh, effect on him, on his play, on his mind. So it turns out that the games that I have not gone to, he's actually performed pretty well and done well. Maybe even some of the acting up is a result of me being there. I didn't think so, but uh, maybe it is. So what I think I've learned from that is the following. For parents listening, if you're not a parent, send this episode to a parent. If you're not a father, send this episode to a father so that they are well-informed. At least kind of get them to think a little bit. Kids care a lot about what you think, particularly when they're playing their sport. So number one, don't be a screamer. That's just going to put more tension in their head. And what I've learned through some of my research is don't even say good things. Don't even say, hey, good job, because that's still every time you even say a positive thing. And one of the parents said, really, don't say positive things. You, you would think that's positive reinforcement. They'll do more of the good thing. That doesn't seem to be the case based on my experience and some of the things I've read. Even saying, you know, nice job or, you know, that was a nice hit. They still depending on your opinion. And the goal is for them not to depend so much on your opinion or my opinion for my kids as to how they play on the field. So the best thing is to be quiet during the game. And after the game is, hey, how did it go? What do you think? You think you played? Yeah, I think I played well. Well, good. Okay. Now, I have not always succeeded in this. I even when I'm quiet during the game and I'm trying to figure out my body language, even after the game, I say, hey, you know, great job, but here's where you can improve. I'm not sure that's the right thing to do, at least not at this stage of, you know, I don't know, 10, 11 and 12 years old, maybe later on, but not now. So it's best not to say anything. And so what I've done is I've gone away, like I walk away when he's at bat and, and things like that to kind of, because my instinct is to say something, again, not a screamer, not what are you doing, but hey, you, you know, watch that ball is high. All right, that's a good swing. That was a high pitch. So, you know, look out next time. Those kinds of things, which I don't think it helps as well. I don't think it helps either. So this is going to be brief. What I've learned with my son as is as it relates to him playing sports. Same thing with basketball, by the way, in the winter. It was the same scenario. So say less, say nothing. Even after the game, say nothing and just kind of ask an open-ended question. Hey, how did it go for you? How do you what do you think? And let them figure it out. The the goal is for them to own it, own their failures, figure out their failures, figure out their process, and own their victories and their good play. And that's that for this year's episode, Father's Day episode on fathering, as now we will go into a wonderful conversation I have with Scott Donald on teaching kids about money and how to be resilient and how for them not to be entitled. So enjoy that conversation with an expert, Scott Donald, on teaching them about money and raising kids. <music> So how would you raise kids so that they're not entitled and spoiled as adults? How do you teach them about money and how to manage money at a very young age? Today's conversation is with Dr. Scott Donald. 
Scott is a brilliant and game-changing entrepreneur behind Gravy Stack, which is an app that teaches and empowers kids to be resilient and responsible with money. His mission is to inspire 50 million kids to be smarter with money so they go on the world and crush it as they grow. He's a co-author of Value Creation Kid, The Healthy Struggles Your Children Need to Succeed. He's also the co-host of the Smart Money Parenting Podcast. Scott has already made tremendous impact with over 6 million kids across America, and there will be undoubtedly tens of millions before his work is done. Today's conversation with Scott is about that, is about how do we teach him about money? Perhaps the skills for kids to develop skills might be more important than education. You know, as a father of three, you know, he had me thinking, he had me thinking. And we spoke about how can kids grow up to be good, responsible human beings and not spoiled and uh, bratty, if you will. Enjoy this amazing conversation with Scott Donnell on raising kids responsibly and for them to learn more about managing money. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention to help you optimize, improve, perfect, if possible, your prostate health and live better with age as a man. As you all know, I talk quite a lot about all things men's health, of course. One of the things that I've learned throughout my 20-year career is all the things that, you know, there's a good book, what, what Harvard Business School doesn't teach you, right? What medical school doesn't teach you. And one of those things is what it contributes to health and well-being and reducing the risk of disease, particularly prostate and all these other things that we deal with as men. I've learned the hard way, probably by the time I saw my hundredth patient saying the same thing, yeah, I wish I had a better relationship with my kid or my kid is not well or my, my, you know, my adult kid, you know, is really unstable and that really, I think there's a connection there. I think there's a connection there. And as you know, I talk quite a bit about parenting or what I call fathering, the role as a father. Only two things I really know about from experience and some research is my work in men's health as a doctor and being a father. Today's guest is Scott Donald. You know all about him because we introduced uh, his bio before this recording. Scott, thanks so much. I am so honored to have you on and for you to have said that you would be on, particularly after now I know before we started recording everything that you're involved in. And I'm like, man, this guy is still getting on a, on a recording with me. So thanks so much for being on. Absolutely. Good to be here, man. Talk about families and kids. That's my whole world. So happy to help. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So here's where let, let's talk a little bit. Talk a little bit about your background. You are a serial entrepreneur. And talk a little bit about yourself a little bit. We're going to go right to the kid thing shortly after. But, you know, I think your history is, is, is actually pretty interesting. You know, when I look at your bio, what I little that I know, I'm like, God, is this guy like 70 something years old? But <laughs> you don't look like it. And you have four young kids. So you've done a lot in your young, young stage of your life. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, yeah. So I come from four generations of mega entrepreneurs mm. that gave the whole thing away to widows and orphans. Didn't pass on the money. And I couldn't be was more that intentional. Yeah. Yeah. They understand true legacy. And that's actually what we teach now with our, you know, we've had 7 million families in all our companies over the last 10 years. And one of the most important things that we teach, because we teach financial literacy, we have gravy stack, which is our banking app now to teach kids the right way to handle money. We have dinnertable.com, which gives legacy strategies to build a strong family legacy. Mm. Well, my family, I mean, they did a lot of good things right. And, you know, I come from four generations of this. My grandpa, my dad built Interwest Bank, mm -hmm. 90 branches, sold it to Wells Fargo for billions of dollars. My grandpa was like Ronald Reagan's bank chair, believe it or not, back in the mm -hmm. late 80s. But they put the whole thing in uh, charitable trust, except for a few million bucks. And they wanted to help the world and not spoil us. Interesting. And they, but I was shredding papers at six years old. My first business was at eight years old. You know, we, they raised us, they trained us to fish and all my cousins are rock stars to uh, like all of us. And wow. I don't have any imposter syndrome. 
from my life. I don't have any silver spoon. I don't have any guilt, fear, shame that this wasn't, you know, based on something I could create in my life with all of our companies. I have a deeper relationship with my family, more respect and closeness with my fam, my parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, siblings. Mm. There's just something there, man. And so that's really what we've been studying for the last decade, mm. which is how do you raise kids the right way? Mm. So I've been obsessed on this for mm. I, I've, my whole goal along with all of our companies is I want to find the best hundred families in the world. Mm. That's what I've been doing. I've been searching the globe for the best hundred families and sitting with them and learning from them, becoming like doing life with them. I got 300 pages of notes on what these families do. Mm. And my metric is not money. My metric is not how rich are they? Because a lot of those families just are screwed up. But my, but some of these families are billionaires or they were billionaires before they donated a lot. My metric was this. How did you raise kids and grandkids and great grandkids to blow by every previous generation in all the metrics that I consider important? What, so, what are some of those metrics, Scott? Yeah. So values, family values, what it means to have your last name, the, the depth of relationships, intimacy with their children and their spouse, financial competency, their impact in the world, the value they create in the world, their skills, their mindsets, just if you do that four generations in a row and every single generation is stronger, like significantly blows by them, you're doing something right. And I want to learn what the heck that is. And so what we've found is there's a recipe to this. Mm -hmm. We have 18 strategies of family legacy that we train on in our dinnertable.com program. I, I, so, I love it. And I can't wait to dig into that a little bit or, or yeah. a lot, actually. Was financial, was finance the family sport? Did you guys participate in like baseball and football? Or is it, yeah. was it all math and finance? No, definitely not. We, you know, I believe in range. Yeah. I played all the sports, you know, we were well-rounded and youth groups and extracurriculars and music and, you know, service projects. And yeah, we did the whole gamut. We weren't like a, some crazy, you know, in the middle of the woods kind of family. Mm. Like it wasn't like that, but they just raised us with a simple set of rules and, and systems. I'd say my family did 60% of what we train on, which is pretty darn good because most families do none of the 18. It's amazing. And those family values was passed on from your great grandparents on down to you guys? Yeah. Yep. Like w with intention? It was like, okay, let's sit down. Let's talk about, you know, it, it was, how, what does that look like, right? So yes. One of the, so I think that we teach our values to our kids by showing them what to do, not just saying what to yeah. do, right? And every now and then we have to say, okay, guys, we, I, I, I call it branding. This is not our brand. Now, yeah, I know your friend does this and your friend does that, but this is not what we do. We yeah. do things like this, but mostly is, you know, showing my kids, you know, my wife and I show them our kids what to do. And honestly, we're starting, I think you're going to, I think you're going to attract a lot of people that they're starting that trend yeah. themselves. They don't have generations before. So yeah, let me, does look, what does one. that look like? Yeah. So our third strategy of family legacy is this, your kids need heritage not inheritance. Man, that's a, that, that is a good one. They're all that good. Yeah. This is just one of the 18, mm -hmm. but I'll, let me unpack that. Your kids need heritage, not inheritance. 90% of generational wealth transfer is pissed away by the grandkids. It not, spoils not the kids. You're right. It spoils the kids, but it ruins the great, or the grandkids and the great grandkids start everything over. So what so is these are your more, Roosevelt's? These are your Roosevelt's, all the Carnegie's, let's say, I don't really, I'm guessing here, but these are the very no, I'm, wealthy. I'm talking about anytime somebody leaves an inheritance to their children, okay, of assets. So 90% of it is gone by the grandkids. Forget the, the Trumps and Rothschilds and Vanderbilts and all those people. Forget those because everybody's like, ah, that's not us. That's weird. Those families are kind of crazy. I understand. Sure. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about legacy. Yeah. Okay. Legacy is raising generations to carry on your name and blow by you and all of the metrics. That's a good legacy. And here's the, 
you know, here's this, the trick here. Some people hear the word legacy and they go, well, that's not us. I, I, cause I'm not qualified to have a good legacy. I've had divorce. I've had sickness. I've had business problems. I have estranged children. We've had sick, you know, I don't like my in-laws, right? They disqualify themselves from this idea of having an incredible family legacy. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, every family has crazy. So you're, that happens everywhere. Even these hundred families we studied, everybody has crazy, but they just put into place those strategies. And uh, what legacy is defined as, if you look it up, it's the actions, events, and relationships in somebody's life that have a long lasting impact. Mm -hmm. That's legacy. So guess what? You can't escape it. You will have a legacy no matter what. The question is, do you want it to be good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want your last name to mean something when you're gone? And so this idea of heritage, not inheritance means it's more about what you leave in your kids than to them. Mm. Okay. It's about a last name that carries on. Mm. Okay. Not just dying with a bunch of dollars and assets to make sure future generations are okay. They actually will be less okay if that's your focus, mm. because the more you leave to them, the, the more it kills their value creation drive, the more it they won't risk. They won't grow. They're waiting for you to die to get your stuff. Mm. And it's a silver spoon. I mean, this is what we talk about. It's trust fund kids, but just as adults. So the, the, and that's what causes estrangement and violence and addiction and divorce. You know, Jordan Peterson told me one time, he said, Scott, the only thing that keeps addicts out of the gutter dead is being broke. So nothing's worse than an entitled kid that r grows to be a victim that gets a bunch of assets mm. given to them. Nothing's worse than that. That is unlimited harm. And what we're not saying is leave them nothing. Okay. There's a way to do it. There's more strategies here. It's not just, oh yeah, make your last check bounce before you're dead. That's not what we're saying. There's a difference between I love you gifts and coasting gifts. Mm. Okay. There's more here to it. But what I'm talking about is spend your focus and your effort and time on heritage. So for us, that's the values of the family. And how do you pass them down to the next generation? And the way to do that is through story. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 30 years, your kids are not going to be sitting around the dinner table talking about some mission statement on the wall. All right of the values of your family. What they will be doing is telling stories. So the best thing we can do as parents is tell principle-based stories of our family, value-based stories. So you figure out what are those four to six things that we stand for as a family? My family, it's pretty simple. Faith, family, fish. My kids say it every single day at dinner. My three-year-old literally said it last night. Faith, family, fish. What's the fish component? Of it. F is fun and adventure. I is integrity, doing the right thing even if no one's watching. S is service and value creation, because that's our book, Value Creation Kid. And then H, hard work. Fish, plus we love the ocean. I grew up on the ocean. We are always at the lake in the summers. We want to teach I, our I, I children. Thought it was to more, fish. I thought it was more, Scott. My, my brain went into teach them how to fish, not give them a fish. That's like, exactly yeah. part of yeah. it. That's why we said it. So, faith, yeah. family, fish. Yeah. And we tell stories of what it means to be a Donald from our ancestors. We tell stories of coming across the Oregon Trail. We tell stories of we go all the way back to King Agrippa of Scotland, right? Like, we tell stories of when Amy and I met, you know, coming to faith our first businesses, when they were born. like, And we look for stories every day of our kids displaying the values of our family and we celebrate the heck out of it. Mm. They become the mantra of the family because we're a big team. Donald's live a certain way. And so, you know, the studies show that kids are five times more likely to carry on the family values if they're rooted in it, if they know where they came from. Mm. So you want to carry on values? Tell stories. If you want to kill a family, get rid of the chief storyteller. Okay. So this is our third strategy out of the 18 and it's a big I one. I love the telling stories and, you know, and it kind of ties in with your dinner table concept because 
what better time to to tell stories, right? And I think that's part of the problem. I mean, look, the reality is we can talk on and on. I have so many ideas and opinions on the whole thing. If I have one takeaway from my experience, and I think we're aligned, you know, one of the things that, so I have daughters that are now 19 and 20, so they're adults, and they're really trying to figure out how the world works and, you know, digital devices and the influence that has on them. And these are females. It has more of an impact, it seems, on females and even males and so forth, right? And atrocities that are happening around the world, right? And a lot of marchings and things. I think the marchings are fine and protests and things. And when I have these conversation, dinner table, so I can appreciate that. It's like, look, if we want the better world, everybody wants a better world. It starts here. It starts right here, right now in this dinner, dinner table. The, these conversations it starts at home. It starts with father, fathering. You know, the absence of fathers, it, I believe, is a huge problem. One of the, the biggest. World, why the world is not the way we want it to be. Yeah. And so at a mic, the, from the micro, you get the macro, right? You can expand on that briefly, but I, I think we're on the same page there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, parents are more critical than ever. The, the biggest war, I think, is on our kids. Yeah. The biggest war in the world is on our children. Yeah. So we have to make sure that we are not outsourcing our parenting. Don't let, so, so at, our, uh, at our church, one of the concepts was don't let culture raise your kids. Yep. Right. That's right. And that was powerful. It was like, absolutely. And what's culture? <laughs> Anything on a digital device, right? That, right? that they're in there, if you're not careful and so forth, they're in there for a long time. Yeah. Here, so here's the thing I mean with that is yeah. so often we outsource, you know, we're taught in business. It's like yeah. eliminate, automate, delegate so you can scale, only do your unique genes. That's good. That's how you create a self-managing company. In your work, you want to automate processes. This is why people love AI. Like, all the new technology, like helping them get more efficient in their work. With parenting, you definitely want to be efficient and you want to like outsource the things that you guys don't want to do outside the home. But in the home, when raising children, there's literally no, there's no block. There's no switch for what you need to do at home with your kids. The most important lessons are not learned at the desk, at school, they're learned at the dinner table. And a lot of parents, they outsource their parenting to, my kids will learn about God at church. My kids will learn about education at school. My kids will learn about discipline at sports. My kids will learn this or that outside the home. And they don't realize that the kids aren't learning those things. And it, you need to make sure that the main things are learned in the home. So we have all these boot camps and things that we have 80 things in our book that we would talk through that's like, hey, schools aren't touching any of these 80 things. And they're all critical for like the real world, mm -hmm. the emotional skills, the relational skills, the business skills, the financial competencies that we do in Gravy Stack, the life skills, they're just missing them in school. And that's why it, you got to stop outsourcing this stuff and, and take it back in the home. And it can be fun. Mm -hmm. Do a daddy boot camp if you're a dad listening. We do these things called boot camps every few days. We're teaching our kids something new and there's a big old list. We just move through it. It's like, here's how we're doing laundry. Here's how we greet strangers that come to our house. Seriously, we need to take it from the most fundamental basic point because I think yeah. that we try to skip and then, but we don't have a good foundation of even how to function. Certainly right. as a person, as a family, you know, one of the things that I have one daughter who's in college and of course she's like, well, what should I major in? I should major in, my major should be let's slow down. Let, let's slow down. You probably shouldn't major in anything. Yeah. And you should look into the intersection of disciplines. That's what you should do. And you should learn about yourself. Who are you going to be in four years when you graduate? Who are you? What kind of person are you? So, so like that, the world doesn't rattle you. So rather than I have to be this major and I have to, and just stay so micro focused, I don't want, I don't want you to be that micro focused. I want you right. to <laughs> right, look, outside the box and see what, you know, see, learn skills that learn all the things that it is these, uh, a school, regardless of the t amount of tuition that we're paying, just will not teach you. Skills beat degrees. 
So what I don't like, because we've had 7 million families come through our companies and we're in 10,000 schools with one of our other companies. Wow. And we ask kids every year, we used to ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? And most kids and teens, they don't even know more than one or two jobs, right? They're like, I want to be whatever my parents are, or I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be a social media influencer because I want to be famous or have a bunch of money. They don't know what all's out there. And instead of asking kids what they want to do when they grow up, what we should be asking them is, what lights you up? What is their flow time? What is it that they do that they are better than anybody else at and they love it and it meets a big need in the world? We call that our sweet spot, okay? I don't like this idea of a calling because it makes people think that they have one thing that they're supposed to do and if they miss it, they've ruined their life. Mm. Same thing with spouses. You're like... Oh no, there's only one woman God has for me on the whole planet. I hope I find her. And if it goes like hard, you're like, oh, I ruined my one woman thing. It was the wrong woman. No, this is all stupid. What we say is hone skills because skills can actually turn into one of a hundred different ways that you can help the world. And so the more skills that you can acquire and test and try, like what lights kids, what lights your kids up? If your kid loves making other people feel better when they're talking to them, maybe that's a counselor. Maybe that's a comedian, right? There's so many things that could be, right? So this is why we should focus on capabilities and skill sets and mindsets, not assembly line education to get the grade, to get to the school, to get the degree, to get the job that may or may not even be there in 10 years. Scott, what do you, what, so what, I mean, your, your oldest kid is how old? Seven, but I've been mentoring, you know, millions of kids for 15 years. So, so what, that's a relative term. I have 21 year old children. If you want to yeah, look at it that way. Exactly. For sure. I, I, I look, I'm glad I, I'm just upset that, you know, we don't live near you in Arizona. Cause I think you, it does take a village. I think we're doing a decent job, but it takes a village. It does. When your seven-year-old is, you know, 15, 16, junior in high school, what's the conversation at that point? What do you think is the conversation? Don't worry about school. Take, take a gap year or two or go right into school. Like what will – because by that point, you know, the tuition cost is going to be significantly more than I pay now, right? Yep. So, so, so you know, what, what do you think you'll – at the dinner table as he or she is asking, hey, dad, you know, I'm going to go to college – Will you discourage them from going to college? Like, what do you think is going to happen at that point, as best as you know now? Yeah. So, you know, I have four kids, seven and under. I have another hundred kids that all my friends' kids, you know, I mentor them. So I'm having these conversations right now. First of all, my daughter is already making hundreds of dollars a month in businesses. She's learning financial skills. She's learning the confidence that comes from creating value for other people, material value. There's three types of value, material value, emotional value, and spiritual value. This is what we teach. It was the, it's, the, it's actually the number one strategy of the 18. Mm -hmm. Teach your kids to create value in the world, not money. Money is a store of value. Mm -hmm. So if you just focus on money, it becomes identity. Money trauma is real, man. Like if you just focus on money, actually kids report to us in our studies that money is the biggest fight in the home. They don't want to talk about it. Only 5% of kids pop out of the womb. Like, how am I making money, dad? Where am I making money, mom? They're the entrepreneurial DNA kids that have a D2, D4 genetic mutation with a propensity to risk. Those other 95, they're not wired that way. And they see parents fight over money. So first of all, we have to turn this conversation around money in the home because it's never taught. I go to, I mean, I spoke on 40 stages in the last month, even Tony Robbins stage at Date with Destiny. And I asked the crowds, raise your hand if you were taught financial skills properly as a child growing up. Zero hands. Okay. So let's take this a step back. The kids that we mentor are financially competent. They know how to create value in all three buckets starting at a young age, right? The best question you could ever ask your kids before bed every night is this question. I'm super excited about today's sponsor, which is Mr. Happy XY Vigor, a formulation to enhance testosterone levels and promote sexual function. 
Mr. Happy XY Vigor, or XYVGGR, was formulated by yours truly to optimize male hormones and free up testosterone and improve sexual health. It also has an abundance of L-citrulline, which helps dilate and open up blood vessels so there's more circulation going into the pelvic area for better erections. Try Mr. Happy XY Vigor today at immrhappy.com forward slash products forward slash XYVGGR. Who did you create value for today? It gives them a lens to look at the world to create that material, emotional, or spiritual value. Material value is what you create and produce in the world. Usually the the byproduct is money. Emotional value is how you think and feel and help others think and feel better. It's what makes for a great friend, a leader, a captain of the team. Uh, And spiritual value is how you get people out of their own mind. How do you get them out of their own like anxiety or selfishness or ego or stress? You connect them to something greater than themselves, a higher mission, a higher calling to God, if you will. I love Jesus. I don't pull any punches, but there's a lot of ways to create spiritual value in the world. It's getting people out of themselves first to something greater, you know, other self-less. So college or no college? Where are we going? Okay. (laughs) College or no college? So my daughter- You know what, honey? Don't worry about college. Let's just- All of my kids, all of my kids are- going to have plenty of confidence and capabilities to go to college or not if they choose. Mm. We're not going to block them. We're not like prepper style, but we're going to have a real good conversation about the ROI of college. College is not for everybody. There should be a lot more people in trades, man. I mean, if you decide to get a property every two years and live in it and rent out the other rooms to your college friends for like, Six years, every two years, you have three properties and you hone a trade that's making six figures right away that you love to do if that's your skill set. And you'll be 10 times ahead of any of your friends that went to college. However, there are certain things that college is important for, right? Certain jobs, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, certain degrees that need to be had. But it's less important now, definitely, than it was decades ago. There are so many like code academies and trade schools and like mastermind groups and these, you know, incubators that really you take, you can learn a bunch of different skills very quickly and very cheap. What I want to do is get kids to be thinking about, about what is the greatest value I can add to the world right now, right? You do not have to have a degree to add a lot of value to the world. And I do worry about higher education. It's not just a propaganda machine. It's a bunch of degrees for a, an increasingly transformative marketplace. So over the next 10 years, more jobs will be created in more different types of industries than in the last 30 years combined. It's that fast. Mm-hmm. So what we have to do is we need to teach our kids to learn how to learn. They have to master skills and you can master a lot of skills and then they can pile on top of each other. You can stack these things. What I want kids to do is think about what do I love that I'm good at that adds the greatest value to the people around me and to the world at large and hone those things. And you can test as many things as you want to do, okay? And just taking a class on something may be good mentally, right? But why not go apprentice or try out things? Go do them in the real world. Mm. Too often we go to the hypothetical And we do all this mental gymnastics on things to try to see what we love without doing things to see what we love. Kids only learn in two ways, fun and real life experience. Two things that schools and higher ed rarely do. It's the opposite, right? It's not fun. (laughs) And it's not practical. It's certainly not real life. Yeah, exactly. The kids learn through fun and real life experience. And so I'm not saying never go to college. I'm saying you need to have that conversation with your kids, probably after driver's license, right? Because what we tell our kids is, look, you're going to do all the work and you're going to get the grades and the scores and the practical you know, resume skills of what you've created in the world. Like You're going to build that up as if you're going to Harvard. 
you're going to have optionality, okay? You're not just going to be like, hey, dad, I'm 10 years old. I'm not going to college. So I'm just going to mail it in for the next eight years. No. But if a child, like I love a gap year. I love the idea of a, take a year after high school. Try a bunch of stuff. Don't take a year and go travel and do nothing and goof off and do drugs and alcohol. No, that's not a gap year. A gap year is intentional. Mm -hmm. Gap year is a mix of service projects and apprenticeships and stuff you do for real money to learn, right? Do things for a three months each for a year. That's great. We have a kid that we've been mentoring. His name's David. He's 21 years old. He took his gap year. He got into college, but he took his gap year. And I've been mentoring him for eight years. Well, fast forward, he got a six-figure job four months into his gap year doing IT. Fell in love with it. Promoted seven times now. Just closed a $60 million deal for his company. He's on his second house. They started a nonprofit to mentor high school kids. And he just found the woman of his dreams. And he reads a book a week. I don't know that many college grads that read a book a week. He's was hungry. He, was he trained by Jim Quick at all? Did you? I mean, I know Jim well, <laughs> yeah. but no, he was trained by me. Yeah. So, on, on, on how to read, I, I meant to say how to read a book, or how to read fast. And read I'm sure he's read. done the hacks. I mean, yeah, yeah. but that's what happens when you get kids like fired up to create value in the world. Yeah. And he is light years ahead of all of his peers that are in college. And they're jealous of him because they're like, I've been sitting around for four years waiting to do what you've been doing. 100%. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do. I love, with it. I love it. I love it. You know, I have, so I have one in college, one that's going to college. And man, I tell you that where they go to school is so the brainwashing, if you will, of you have to go to college and you have to go. And I'm saying, slow down. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. Yep. And I'm promoting a gap year and it's a tough, it's a tough sale because, you know, this is continuous, you know, conditioning of you, know, you do this. And it, it's not coming from the parent. Actually, it's yeah. coming from the schools or their own desires. You know, Scott, you mentioned quite a bit and alluded to and actually mentioned a, a lot about spirituality. So I'll tell you my background is that we raised our kids. We were, and some people say, I'm spiritual, not religious, and so forth. Okay, we're sort of going to just kind of put it all in one and versus just being, I don't know, just atheist, I guess. We so we raised our older two. You know, we we were Catholic, which you know, in our mind means we're not religious. We, we don't. You only go for Easter and those kind of things. And I, when I observed my good friends who are religious, like, wow, they have great structure, right? Like on Fridays we do this. You know, on if you're Jewish on Saturdays we do that. If you're Christian on Sundays we do that. If you're Mormon, so I have Mormon friends on Sundays we do that. so much structure that just yeah. seems like like how do you find this structure otherwise, right? And look, I have atheist friends who they seem fine to me, but many of them don't have kids. So, and, and many of my religious friends became more religious once they started having kids. Yeah. So how important in your opinion is something, whatever religion versus just having no religion or no religious structure uh, to raise kids properly? That's a loaded question, a loaded but I'm happy to talk about and very, it. And very provocative in this day and age. I, I, it's an important conversation. It is, but I definitely believe in freedom of speech and people can believe whatever they want. Like my favorite part about what we do at Gravy Stack, which is our banking app or dinner table, we have people of all walks, all faiths, all political values. Everyone should disagree on things. I, I actually believe in that. We need to have, we need to bring back healthy discussion and practical thinking and critical thinking like there's just not enough of that in the world so i've just become more bold and being like i think this is this what do you think you know so you know me personally i'm a christian i love jesus i've studied all the major world religions mm -hmm. but for me religion is going through motions but for me it's about a relationship with god like i want a relationship with Jesus that is actually in influencing my day to day, mm -hmm. right? He gives me peace. He gives me care and love and, and protection. He comforts me. He gives me grace for my family. He, I get wisdom from scripture on how to parent. Like I believe it's a living, active relationship. So to me, I'm actually in, 
I don't think religion itself is the answer. Mm. It does provide structure. We're going to church on Sunday. We're going to youth group. We're going to mass. We're going to, I get it that, that structure is good for children. Tr structure is good for family, period. I 100% I agree with that. But I don't think that life should be just going through the motions with a God who is a billion miles away that I have no personal relationship to. The greatest transformation I've seen in my marriage and in my own life and with my children is growing a personal relationship with God mm. that they can go to him and ask for help, ask for forgiveness, ask for wisdom. How do I love my friend better? How do I forgive this? How do teach me, oh Lord, you know, and we want to train our children in the way we want them to go. And on, and I believe true peace only comes from the surpassing love of God. Like, and all wisdom comes from God. Knowledge comes from the world, but wisdom comes from God. So this is my personal feeling that I don't know how I would raise, you know, well-rounded, loving children without faith. I, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. But maybe other people have figured it out amazingly well. I just have seen that if my kids can can grow a deep personal relationship with God, that so much of their life will be not happier, but more fulfilled and peaceful and have a, a rudder to it, mm -hmm. right? Like you just, you don't say, I, I became a Christian so I can be happy. That's not it. Like that's, happiness is actually a bad idea to, to go, go after because it's fleeting. Right. It's temporary. I don't want my children to just chase happiness. Hey, do what makes you happy. Right. Follow your dreams. Like, no, be of service. How about that? Be well, a loving person. What can make you happy, I don't know, is smoking a lot of marijuana, drinking a lot of alcohol. That can make you happy. Some people get you know, some people are happy killing animals. I mean, it's like, <laughs> exactly. like let's be careful here. So, yeah. you know, live a life of love and service of others. Yeah. Focus on being a, a kind, gracious faithful, gentle, strong, you know, friend or sibling or employee, you know, there's a lot of things there that I think are good for their life. And that's, and Jesus like opened my eyes. Like I have experienced Jesus in my life mm -hmm. like a hundred times. So for me, like there's no denying it, but yeah. Yeah. I would wonder, you know, I, I, you know, I'm far from imposing religious views on anybody because, uh, you know, again, I, we just sort of started and it's been great for our family or restarted, but it's been great for our family after finding a right congregation. But I know that, you know, I look for 80 20 rule, right? It's always 80 20 rule, right? I'm sure there's 20%, maybe less actually, with no religious values, no structure, that somehow they figured it out. If you're five feet six, you're not going to play in the NBA just because Muggsy Pills was five four and played in the NBA, right? Yeah. Like, that's not Spud Webb. I mean, you can count them with one hand how many under six feet played in the NBA. Right. So I'm not going. Those are not good. That's not good probability, right? So I look at success and I look at, and it's like, yeah, and success defined by, you know, look, the, there was a very wealthy guy who was a patient of mine, right? And we talk a lot. And I said, so what's, you know, I said, Larry, what's success to you? What, what does that I mean? You've done so many. What's success? He's about 72. He said, Gio, the truth? He said, yeah, it's the truth. He said, when my kids call me dad. When my kids say, dad, can you? I'm like, God, this is great. Dad, can, dad, you know, when they text me, dad, you know, I love you. Have a great day or whatever. Happy Father's Day. So like, oh, this guy has done so much. And you would think, you know, when I, you know, he was a real estate guy, when I built this building or that building, you no, know, when my kids call me dad. So. Yeah. I, you, you get a lot of uh, pearls. I, I get a lot of pearls from, from people in, in general. It's so All good. Right, let's go right into the financials. Financial literacy for kids. I got to tell you, Scott, that I'm going to dive right in because I have no clue. <laughs> do. Nobody have has no a clue. clue. I'm like, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, you want to do a lemonade stand? Yep, yeah, go right ahead. And, you know, after, beyond that. You know, he's like, should I go? I think they hear things. Should I go on, on an app to trade, you know, to stocks and, you know, Robin Hood? Should I get on Robin Hood, Dad? And I don't know. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I have no, no guy. So how do you, when do you start talking money, how money works? 
Yeah. What's a good, you know, one of the good books out there, in my opinion, maybe you can chime in is the psychology of money. I don't know about for kids, but definitely for adults. That's a good one. Well, but it starts with adults, Scott. Right. I mean, it, it is the adult, <laughs> you know, it is, yep. you, you know, that it's even emotional intelligence, all these things starts with adults. And then you try to teach that to kids. Yeah, we so, have, uh, it's like Pavlov's, I agree with you 100%, by the way. I thought you meant having a kid read the book, but no, you get the parents need to read that book. Yeah. The parents need to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Acres of Diamonds, our book, Value Creation Kid, bestseller already. It's number two on Wall Street Journal. Nice. You need to read Psychology of Money. Like these are all critical books to read. However, you, if you get some of this that I'm going to give you, you can make an, an incredible dent in your kids right now, like a huge win. I'll, I'll just give you very practical stuff right now. And this applies at age two to five with the quarter system. This applies from ages six to 18 using gravy stack. This applies in college or this applies with 30 year old, 40 year old kids and grandkids. Okay. It does not matter where you're at with your family. It's never too late to do this stuff. Okay. So the first thing I have to say around this issue of money, it is the least talked about thing in the home. It's the biggest fight. It's the least talked about. Crazy. Kids, kids, I'll, I'll start with this. Kids need to have the right view of money first. Then they need to understand how to make and manage it. So the, the right view of money is that money is neither good or bad. Money is a store of value. If you think it's all good, then it becomes identity. Like if families just like money, which they rarely do, but what happens is the kids are not trained in it. And so then they realize the moment they have their own bills that it's everything and it becomes identity very quickly. Mm -hmm. And they see their parents using money as status, keeping up with the Joneses, shopping therapy. They see their parents using money to bribe them, coerce them, buy their love by buying stuff for them with money. Especially in co-parenting situations, kids go to one parent to the other and get bribed and coerced to love them more. It's the worst money trauma I've seen. So money is not good. Money is not bad either. If you think money is bad, that's the number one poverty mindset. It's evil. Profit's evil. People think the Bible's against... Capitalism is evil. Yeah. People think the Bible is against it. The Bible's communist. No, that's the, I, I was a theology major, dude. I know exactly what the Bible talks I, about. I didn't know that. I, th I would have thought you were like a math or economics or no, business major. I was a business and theology double major. I didn't know if I was going to be a pastor or an entrepreneur. And my senior year at, in college, I got written in as student body president. Didn't even run. Everybody wrote my name in. And so I became student body president and my theology professor booted me. He goes, you're not a pastor. Everyone here knows you're not a pastor. Your way to, to, to serve the world is in business. Go do that. And, you're, and, he, and then he said, in 25, 30 years, you'll probably come run this university. And I'd be honored to work for you. To completely change my life. And here we are today. Okay. So uh, I say this to families ab about the money thing. It's neither good or bad. It's a store of value. We need to make it commonplace conversation in the home. Mm. Okay. So we have over 200 money conversations for dinner, all these different things. Okay. But I will say this, kids do not care about money until they have a motive to earn it. All right. So you have to give your kids gigs and expenses to pay for. So let me walk you through this. It's called the home economy system. The home economy system is three E's and it's not allowance, by the way. Allowance is socialism. It doesn't work. Your kids do not need free money allowance every week. Socialism. They should actually. You know, you're, you, yeah. you know you're, you, do you know you're talking to a Cuban? <laughs> you're talking to a Cuban here. And it's like, I love that yeah. line. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your, your, your kids should never have the same amount of money coming in every week. All right. Allowance is codependency. It's, it creates a lack of motivation and an aversion to work. So don't do allowance and don't just make them do chores either. Like you'll have a ton of conflict over it. Like don't pay them allowance for chores. That's, they shouldn't get rewarded for just time and effort. Kids should be thinking about charging for results, not time and effort. That's a critical piece that we talk about. So don't do allowance or chores, I'll, I'll, but don't do no chores. I'll show you how to do this. It's called the three E's. Number one, you do expectations. Number two, expenses. Three, extra pay opportunities. 
This is what all 100 of the best families in the world did. Mm. They didn't do allowance and chores because half those chores you should do for free as your role in the family. The other half of those chores you should be paid for one off by creating value with them. And now the kids learn how to do way more things than just a simple list of chores. They do stuff in the community, in the neighborhood. They're earning money. They're creating financial competency. So the first E is expectations. The list of things that you don't pay your kids to do, it's just their role in the family. Make your bed, clean your room, brush your teeth, homework first, dishes, trash, things like that. The second thing is pass off expenses early. Age six, my daughter is in charge of birthday presents for her friends and toys and sports stuff already at seven years old. Okay. And as they grow to get their driver's license, they should be fully autonomous. This is like social outings, cavities, shoes and clothes. Anything that they need to get should be on them. And if you do this, you pass off responsibility and freedom to them. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Most parents think my job is to pay for everything and give them all the things I never had. That will entitle them, period. Oh, and the, man, uh, that is um, unbelievable. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm late to the party. My yeah. daughter is 20 years old, freshman in college, and we just started having a conversation. I said, sweetheart, we'll take care of school. We'll take care of it. But you, your personal stuff, it's on you. And, right. And you can do this. She's 20. I w I'm thinking, man, I should have started at least 10 years ago, if not more. Yeah. So I'm loving and, it. And the conversations get harder as they get older, because if you pay for everything as they're growing up, they expect the bank of mom and dad to go as long as possible, yeah. sometimes till they're 40 years old. I see and, all the time. Yeah. So the second is the expect. So it's expectations, expenses. By the way, if you pass off expenses, they learn the price of goods. Anyone listening to this, does your kid know the price of eggs or milk? Like not until they're on their own. You, they need to learn the price of their clothes, right? They need to learn the price of tools. They need to learn the price of sports equipment. They will take, they won't take it for oh, granted. God. I'm loving, I am so, so, and again, whatever I, I have not done it right. Just listening to you, but there's certain things like this just makes sense, right? It just, it matches son, the real world. Yeah. My son is 11 years old, right? And you know, we have personal training, catcher right travel team yeah. equipment and i see him like sometimes he's like uh you know like sluggish about it i said like, do you know what's happening here let me explain to you in fact get out a pen i said travel two thousand dollars yeah did you know that's who i didn't know two thousand yes who about two thousand dollars a year right um personal training a hundred dollars a day every day yeah right? and you got to bring your a game here buddy and guess what i am taking you sitting there watching and taking you back. There's something called opportunity cost. That yep. means that I cannot do other things that I need to do yep. because I'm here with, I want to be here with you. I, but you need to bring your best self every time. I just literally, and I told this to some of my friends like, Oh, Gio, you're going to traumatize them. <laughs> Clearly the expert is, it looks like the expert agrees with me. So I'm no. glad that you're saying that. But it's the way we have the conversations that, that are critical. So watch this piece, okay? Yeah. So once the expenses are starting to be passed off, we have 12 categories in Gravy Stack, our app, that you start passing off. And now that you do that, you save hundreds of dollars a month, maybe more, okay? And now you can pay them to do gigs. Not chores, gigs. Don't say chores anymore because it turns the kids off. They feel like it's more homework. Right. That's another, yeah, that's a great word. Yeah. So we call it gigs and li listen to this because it's not chores. Watch. So there's action gigs and there's brain gigs. Action gigs are the things they can do to create value around the house. Sweep the garage, vacuum, make a meal, clean a bathroom, wash the windows, yard work, alphabetize your books, whatever, a bunch of stuff, right? But then on top of that, we add brain gigs and brain gigs are kids learning to use their brain to create value. All adults do. And why do we not teach it to kids? We just make them go do a bunch of manual labor. It's ridiculous. They got to learn hard work. Yes. But brain gigs are the key here because they love it. They are. It's a good example, Scott. Plan the next family, plan the next family trip on a budget. Three flights, three hotels, where are we eating? You plan it. Here's your budget. They'll save you thousands on the trip. And they learn all these skills by doing it, right? And they'll own the trip. They'll love the trip. They'll think about it for years to come. There's, that's one of a hundred, man. So 
practical skills using their brain. I love, hey, give your kids a podcast to listen to or a, a YouTube that's powerful for their life or a book to read and you'll pay them by reporting on what they're going to do in their life differently. One thing they learned and one thing they're going to apply to their life right now. That's a brain gig. A PragerU video. We have one of our, several of our hundred families, the grandparents, they don't do birthday Christmas money. They do gigs like I'm explaining. They're like, I'm giving you 10 bucks for every one of these PragerU videos you watch and tell me a report of what you're going to do in your life differently because of it. And they've given thousands to the grandkids. It's the best way to pass on skills and finances because the kids are creating value with it. How about a subscription hunt? In Gravy Stack, we have this thing called a subscription hunt. We teach kids to cancel unneeded like monthly subscriptions from parents. The kids do the work. They cancel. They call. They do all the work. And the average family saves $547 in that one day. Okay? We have tons of these, man. And so they're missions and challenges and training that are practical things. Flipping the, assets in the garage. Yeah. Flip assets in the garage that we don't want anymore and you get half yeah. the cut. Go right? online. My daughter started doing that, the clothing and things like that, right? I'm very proud yeah. of her in that regard. She started selling things that we don't use and people are buying it. <laughs> That's right. It's, so these things, and, and when you mix them together, it's not chores. I just gave you something that's wholly different than chores. It's this fun, intrinsically motivating meets real world experience to earn money. And now the kids, they know how to create value and they're earning money. Kids won't learn unless they earn. So if you do the three E's the right way, what's the third E? Scott? Extra pay. So that's the gigs, extra pay opportunities, gigs. I see. Got it. So all these gigs and in the gravy stack app and in dinner table, you can just download the app right now. It's going to be free. It's literally free. Right now, you just download the app and you go in Gravy Stack with your kids or teenagers mm -hmm. or even college kids can use Gravy Stack. We have a ton using them. And they have, you just set up this auto repeating. You throw in a gig here and there and the kids see it. It's one click. They get their weekly payday. All the money auto splits between their saving, which gets like a return. Their sharing, which hooks up to any 501c3 in the country. And their spend jar with their debit card. So they can see all the flow of money and then they have their expenses to cover needs first than wants. So it's all of the automatic splits and you choose the percentages of which jar the money goes into. So it's automatically splitting it. You know, most kids think that if I make 50 bucks, I can spend the 50. Yep. With our kids and all the gravy stack families, they know they got to make 70 or 80 to spend 50 because 20 to 30% is going into saving and investing. 10% is going into sharing and then 40 to 50 uh, is going into the spend or 50 to 60 is going into spend. It just depends, right? And so now they're learning all of the financial skills they need. And are you, think about a kid who goes through that for 10 years. You think that kid's worried about a degree or what job they're going to have or the future? Nope. Most of the kids who do this for five years in your home before they leave, are, are easily six-figure kids by the age of 22, 23. Easy six-figure. It's a, it, We call it the million-dollar swing. If you learn to use your skills and your capabilities and the confidence you gain from doing this out in the real world, you will get the job first. You will get the promotion. You will find all these ways to earn. You do not have to worry about your kids when they do this stuff. They're set. Okay? So we have this funny, I, I, like this. it's not funny, but it's true. You can either uh, raise your kids right, and then you can spoil your grandkids and have some fun. But if you spoil your kids, I guarantee you'll be raising your grandkids. Oh, man. You, you got some great lines going here. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it is true. It, it, it's absolutely. It's, you know, I'm listening to you, and I'm like, so you remind, so much of my work is, what are the lifestyle things you can do in a more prescriptive way for you as a man to overcome a condition, prostate problem and live better with age? So that when you're 80, you're like, man, I feel better than when I turned 70, right? So it's like, you know, exercise and you know, blah, blah, blah. There's nutri nutrition and things. And there are times where I'm feeling, and I'm feeling like, wow, am I, are they excited to, wow, I can do this? Or are they feeling shamed? It's like, oh shit, I'm such a F up. You know, I feel I'm there right now with what you're saying to me. I'm like 50-50. I'm like, man, I'm excited. I can teach my kids. I'm like, also, I'm like, I'm such a 
I'm such an <laughs> F up, you know, I'm like, God, you idiot. The, what have you done to show your kids you you haven't done jack shit? No, <laughs> yeah. So I'm feeling that's how I feel, and I think a lot of our audience uh, would feel that way. But I think if, if we flip it, because uh, you know I see it with my work, because like once they get going, eh, there's no shame in it. They're, this is part of, and they'll that's right. Amazing things. So the number one thing that you and I probably get asked in our lives, this is the number one question I get: is where were you 20 years ago? This is what I get. Mm. But I'm but I got to tell you the truth: it does not matter when you start, what matters is that you start. Because the, I've seen transformation happen at young, teenage, college, 20s, 30s, grandkids, reparation of re like repairing relationships at old 75 year old, like grandparents were like, what do I do? You just put these strategies, these 18 strategies, you just put them into practice. The home economy system is our second of the 18 strategies that we have. We have a whole list of gigs for adults, man. They needed. I, I have a hundred gigs right now that your daughter in college should do and you should pay her for them. And they're awesome. Credit score stuff, insurance stuff, tax stuff, DMV stuff, learning like basic home maintenance stuff, like filters, cars. Like there's so many easy things that they're just not learning that you can throw in there and we get, we feed them to you. It's like, here's the next one. And they're great. Because then the kids learn exactly how to do them and they're confident for the rest of their life. So it doesn't matter when you start because, it, look, every family has crazy. Every family. Yeah. And everyone, when they start implementing these things, regardless of the age, it's like a light switch. Off to on. It's so fast and simple. Like your conversation with your daughter should go something like this. Sweetheart, we love you. We're so thankful of everything you're doing. And we want to give you more responsibility more freedom and more trust from us. Is that what you want? Yes, it is what, what yes it is what I want, daddy. Every kid wants that. So, we've been thinking about what we want to do. We want to set up a system where over the next 6 months you're going to be in charge of these things now, not us. Whether it's the credit card, books, the food, the dorm, the insure whatever. And it's like and we want to we have a plan that we're going to set up for you to be systematically handling all these things on your own. And, but six months is the deadline. And so I want to make sure that we spend the next six months getting you up and ready to go. Sound good? Let's go. It doesn't break relationship. It builds trust, you know? And, and then with a young kid, you know, your 11 year old, Hey buddy, mom and I have been talking or I, I've been thinking, do you want more freedom and responsibility and our trust? Do you want more of that? Yeah, I do. Because kids want that. They want more independence. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to be in charge of these things now. And we have ways for you to earn three, four, even five times as much money as you've ever had before. And you're going to be paying for these things and learning on what you want to get. It's up to you what you want to get, but you got to plan ahead. You know, this is how kids learn to budget. This is how they learn delayed gratification, the price of goods, trade-offs of goods, goal setting, everything. Okay. It's really simple conversations and they love you for it because you set up that conversation in a way that really transforms their future. And what it does is it truly protects your relationship long-term. It just protects it. The older they get and the more we entitle them because entitlement turns into victimhood. So the more you spoil and entitle and pay for everything and, and not let them learn and go through healthy struggle on their own, the more that they will blame you if something goes wrong later. Scott, I am telling you, man, this is, and I know this is not even a master class, and it feels like a master class because I know that there's more to it. I, thank you so much for taking time. This is, this is so important. You know, I always say the many of the things, look, I, 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 I trust that people are getting great information from me and the podcast and my interviewees as it relates to prostate stuff and testosterone. But this right here, this is really important and something that's really meaningful to me as a very involved father and the process of fathering. What does that, you know, verb, the action of being a, fa a father. Yeah. And I can't wait to get, get started and get going with these conversations with my kids and, and my wife. Thank you so much for being on. How can, you know, how can people get in touch with your work, find out more about your work and yeah. any final thoughts are? I'll, I'll give a free gift for everybody listening. If they made it this far, it tells me that they care about their family. So our free gift is, I just want to give you the 18 strategies. 
and you can book a call with our team as well if you want to get more info and you know maybe get the app get the course you know go through the family legacy trainings we do but we'll give you the 18 strategies if you just go to info.dinnertable.com go right there put your info in we don't spam anybody we just send you the stuff you can book a call with any of our experts to help your family walk you through these things and then yeah go there get the free gift if you want to grab the book on Amazon it's just called Value Creation Kid Download the app. It's just the Gravy Stack app. Stack your gravy. If you got kids ages six and up, just go there. Those are the best ways to follow up with me. And then I'll say this one last thing too. We license people. Mm -hmm. So all the training that I'm talking to you about, we our 18 strategies, we are licensing family legacy coaches. Businesses get this for their employees. Mm -hmm. Financial advisors, doctors, real estate lawyers, insurance people, they get it for their clients. No. They want to learn this information so they can be better at helping their business or their family or their friends. So we're certifying people and they go through our training and they're certified to give out all of our stuff to their community. And it's a great business too. If you want to turn into a business, it's like a six figure business in a box. So people want to do that, just fill out the same link and we can follow up with you there. Hey man, thanks so much. This is, this was amazing. Thanks Scott. I really appreciate your time here. And ho hopefully we'll have you on again. I think there's more for us to discuss here. Thanks Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with Scott Donald on so much, so many elements of how to be better parents uh, and certainly how to have uh, kids that are more financially astute or fiscally astute. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Much love. <laughs>